kids get to go to a lot of different places this year. They requested it last year. Mm -hmm.
is that the climates do change over time. And at this time, at the time when the world looked like this, there was really no ice on either the Arctic or the Antarctic. And so th this is what things could look like. So you can, you can take a look down here and realize that aside from uh, a few mountains that, that came across Texas, and uh, the, the, believe it or not, there's actually a couple of mountains in northern Louisiana and in Mississippi here, but all of what we consider to be most of the South, the old Confederacy, was underwater at the time. So what I want to do is now is take you guys into this area, which is something that I have not taken many of you groups into before. Because when you want to talk about epigenetics, OK, so. This is, this is what they call a panorama, and this was, uh, this was Kansas's contribution to the World's Fair, I think in Chicago in 1880 or 1890, I forget what the exact date was, but all of this was taken and, and exhibited in the World's Fair, and the, uh, the guy who was the director of the museum at the time had collected all of these animals and stuffed them, basically. And so, what I want you guys to see here, one of, the, one of the things we want to talk about a little bit is differences between males and females, which are interesting in, in a lot of these, these cases because males and females carry basically the same genes. The, the same set of genes are present in males and females. The main difference, anybody remember what the difference is between males and females in mammals? It's either XX or XY. Either XX or XY. And which is which? XY is male. XY is male. XX is female. All right, so females have two Xs. But uh, in, in the male, both the X and the Y are active chromosomes. But in the female, only one of the Xs is usually active. You guys know, remember that? Or have you been talking about that? And, and how, how, does that, how does the other X get shut down? Hmm? Yeah. Basically, basically, the other X gets shut down through changes that they, 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 that's essentially when, when, when the embryo is forming, one of the X chromosomes gets shut down because it essentially gets coated with methylation and, and other things like that that, that that keep it from being active. But what you can also see here, which, which is one, of, one thing we have here in this, in this particular case, is a nice series from a baby to a juvenile to a young animal to an adult female to an adult male here. Okay, how do you guys tell the differences between them? Size, size. 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 and the tusks. Female, female walruses have tusks, male walruses have big tusks. Because the males use them to fight with each other, but the female walruses need them too because they're also important in some of the things they're doing. Now, the, the uh, Inuit name for these guys is tooth walkers. Because what they do is, is that when, they, when they're, they, they climb out on ice, not on places like this, when they climb out on ice, they stick their tusks into the ice and use it and sort of haul themselves up. Using because they, they sort of use these like grappling hooks to, to, grab, to, to stick into the ice and then they crawl up once, once their, their tusks are sucking. So both the males and females need that. And so that's really important to them in terms of the, uh, you know, just their basic livelihood. Now, the younger animals struggle a bit more doing that, obviously. But one of the things that, that, that I want you guys to remember here is like we talked about is, is aside from the X, aside from the Y chromosome, the males and females of these guys are basically have the same set of genes. So the female technically has a the capacity to grow bigger tusks. So why doesn't she? We get the genome expression and shut off. Somewhat, yeah. Yeah, the hormones, the hormones that you have in your body, since male, males and females have, they, again, they have the same hormones but different amounts. Females have, to, males have, have more testosterone and less progesterone than females do. Females have more progesterone and less, less testosterone. 
But females have testosterone and males have progesterone, but just in, in relatively small amounts relative to the opposite sex. And so this is one of the things that leads to all sorts of differences in individual mammals, is that the, the level of hormones circulating in your body that are produced by your body can affect essentially what you look like and, and who, you know, basically who you are in a lot of ways. Okay, so talking about the walruses, let's move now to the polar bears. And if you guys want to see a polar bear up close and personal, here's one. So this is our, our pet polar bear here. Yeah, but he has, he has really, really thick fur. Now, what do you guys, do you guys remember what we talked about with this guy before? Yeah, his skin. <laughs> what, what color is his fur? Not really white. white. What color is it really? Black. 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 Well, yeah. it's clear. Clear? It's clear. If you were able to take a look at this under a microscope, it would look like a little uh, optic cable, fiber optic cable almost. And the reason it looks white is what, what color, what is white in terms of the, the spectrum? It reflects what? All the colors. All your, it reflects everything. So, so if something reflects everything, it looks white. If something reflects almost nothing, it's black. So he has clear fur so that the, so when the sun hits his fur, if you remember this guy lives in the Arctic, it goes through his fur and gets trapped in his fur. The, the, the heat from the sunlight gets trapped in his fur. And what color is his skin underneath the fur? Black. Black. He's, he's very, very black. You look at, it, at, at his nose and his lips and the bottom of his paw here, you know, the whole bunch like that, and see that he's, you, can, you can't see it that way. Okay, so the interesting thing about polar bears is they're actually a very young species. They're not very old. They're, they're, they're probably less than half a million years. And they, owned, they did not uh, really evolve until the Arctic became fairly covered with ice, which is one reason so people are so worried about them now going extinct. Because if the Arctic loses its ice, these guys will lose their habitat. The walruses will also lose their habitat. Because walruses and polar bears are two species that completely depend upon the ice as a big part of their ecology. If the ice goes away, these guys probably will have to really change their, their style of life or go extinct. Isn't it true that some polar bears are moving more south? Yeah, they are moving south and they're, and they're also interbreeding with grizzly yeah. bears. Is that why like, they hybridize with grizzly bears because they're such a young species? Right. They, they're a very young species and they're, very, very, they're not all that different genetically than grizzly bears. So this is why they're, they're capable of interbreeding with one another. Their um, offspring able to like uh, donate. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, they do fine. Okay. Now, what I want to get into here again is we, we're looking. At, I want you guys to, to pay attention to this stuff over the because I'm going to walk you through a whole series of examples here. Here we have. This is the Arctic tundra, and you can see the muskox and these are what are called barren ground caribou. How do you tell a male and female, male caribou from a female caribou? Mm -hmm. Well, the what? Yes. All right, the antlers. But does the female have antlers? Yes. Okay. Now, this is really interesting because remember what I talked about with the genes and all. Female caribou are one of the only species of deer where the female actually have antlers too. And people have, have sort of suggested that, they are, that, that that's important because they need to protect their calves, who don't have anything, from wolves. Whereas the males have big, much more elaborate looking antlers. The same sort of thing you can look at if you look at the doll sheep up here. You can see that the, male, the big adult males have big horns. Mm -hmm. And they are, the same spe they are basically the same species as our big horn sheep. The females are the ones on, on the, the, in the middle there that have the smaller little goat-like horns. So again, you have a species where the males have a big expression of a trait, the females have a smaller expression of the same trait. But they, they, they both have the exact same genes capable of producing the, these sorts of things. So how do you think those differences come about then? Through the environment, you know, they like 
Well, what, we're talking about males and females here. I guess in the, the X and Y. Well, the X and the Y, but what? Are, how do the X and Y? The X and Y are not going to control the horns directly. This is the testosterone. What, what are the What are the X and Y likely to control? Testosterone. testosterone. Yeah. testosterone. Right. The amount of testosterone that's that's in them, because if the uh, if you take, took a female and inject her with testosterone, she could grow bigger horns or bigger antlers. Same thing with a female with a chicken. If you take a chicken and inject her with testosterone, she'll grow a comb like a rooster and start crowing. So that when when hormones are what's actually causing something to happen, what's going on inside the body, the body or inside the cells? The cells are receiving those chemical messages. Right. And what do those messages do? Tell the cells what to do. Right. They, by, but but exactly when, when you by, by telling when you say tell the cell what to do, what it's are they doing? Express different the genes needed. Yeah, they're 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 regulating the genes. They, now that doesn't mean only turning them on and off. You can turn them on at relatively low levels or turn them on at high levels too, which is another thing to keep in mind when you're talking thinking about epigenetics. It's not always just on or off. It's sometimes it's. Uh, uh, a little bit on or a lot on. It's like if you have, you, you have a, a, a faucet and you can turn the water and you can get a, just a trickle or you can turn it on and come out with a blast of water. It's the same sort of thing. Your, your cells are capable of regulating things at that level. So when you're looking at the, the males and females of these some of these species, uh, what you can see is that the, again, the differences we see between them are more the result of hormones and regulation of hormones than of genes, than of genetic differences. All right, now here we get into what are called woodland caribou. And the, what's the difference between these woodland caribou and those barren ground caribou? Antlers. Antlers. Okay, what about the antler shape? All right, it's shorter and thicker, and why would that? Why might that be? So they don't get stuck in tree branches. But yeah, they don't. Yeah, that, that's probably a good idea. They don't get up tangled so much when they're in the trees. Now look at the female. The the, the, the female caribou, the barren ground caribou, has fairly long antlers. Mm -hmm. The female woodland caribou has very short antlers. So again, you're you're looking at the sort of, you know. Male female differences. Now, when I walk you over here into the North Woods, I'm starting to see these are, these are moose, and moose are the biggest species of deer. Okay, what do you see about the male and female moose? Females don't have the female moose does not have antlers. Only the male moose has antlers. And so, what sort of difference do you think would be producing that sort of thing? Yeah, the, the, the gene that, that, that leads to antler growth is shut off in these guys. Okay, why is it a good idea to shut down growth of antlers? Yeah, it takes in a huge amount of nutrients. Yeah, you have to realize that the, what, what is an antler? It's bone, but it's bone that you grow and shed every year. And there's a lot of bone there. Imagine having to grow the equivalent of another R, a couple of arms on top of your head every year. Right. Right. Exactly. The, fe the female doesn't need the, the antlers, so she takes the nutrients that would be used to, to grow antlers and uses them to grow the, her baby or to take care of her own skeleton. Because when female and mammals are pregnant, they often, and, and so the same thing's true in birds, is they will actually take part of their bone and use it to produce the, the skeleton for the baby or the shell, the eggshell in birds. So again, the, the thing to keep in mind is there's all sorts of complex things going on. So now if you look at the white-tailed deer there, right next to the moose, 
Again, what do you see with the male and female? Uh, the female has no yeah, the male has antlers, the female doesn't. So that by the time you've got down to, to, to this type of environment, you've essentially you've reached a situation where the females no longer have a, a need to have antlers. Now, another thing that can happen with, with white-tailed deer, though, and, and occasionally with moose, that, that doesn't happen with the caribou is how many babies does the female you know, produce? Well, normally in caribou, they produce how many at a time? One. These guys can actually have twins. Oh. Now, you, you, do, you, you have to pay a lot of attention to being out in nature to see a female deer with twins, but female deer can have twins. And one of the things that's really interesting about female deer that we're, we're still trying to figure out is that if female deer have twins, they almost always have a boy and a girl. They don't have, they don't have identical twins. They have one, one male and one female offspring. And a female deer that's in not very good condition will produce a female offspring. A female deer who's in reasonably good condition will produce one male offspring. But a female who's in really good condition will produce twins and she'll produce one of each. So how do you think that she manages to, to control that sort of thing? Uh, like, like the environment and the amount of resources she has available. Well, but how, how, what mechanism could she use to determine the sex of her offspring? All right. Yeah, that's the one, one part of it would, would possibly be the hormones. I mean, this is something we really are not sure about. All we know is that they can do this. We're not exactly sure yet how they do it. But they're certainly capable of doing this because if you look at it, you know, if, if you get female deer, especially if they're young or they've been sick or something, if they have a baby, it, it'll, it'll be, they'll have one and it'll be a, a female. And the reason is, what's the reason why produce a female or a male? Right. So, so what are, what are you saying? What what is it about males that, that, that are it's hard on mothers? So we say they're expensive. Males are expensive because they're bigger and they grow faster, and they usually want more milk and everything because they're trying to grow faster. So a female who's in not very good condition can still reproduce and have offspring. But, a fit, but producing a daughter is less expensive in terms of her own, the energy demands on her body. Now, producing a son is more expensive, but if you're a female in really good condition, you produce one of each. And that way, you, you cover all of your bases. But you have to be in really good condition to do that. Now, do you guys have any questions about anything we've been looking at in here so far? Have identical twins ever been born? Uh, I suppose it's possible. As a rule, they're not because, like I said, they tend to be one male and one female. And you can't have identical twins that are of different sexes. It just doesn't happen. You can, you know, do any of you have twins in your families? Or members of your families have twins or anything? My mom and my uncle were uh, twins. Right. They're of different sex. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they're not identical twins. Human, humans can have identical twins, yeah. but in identical twins, a zygote splits right after it's been fertilized and, in, and forms two separate individuals which have exactly the same genes. With fraternal twins, what happens? Two two separate, each, there are two separate zygotes that become fertilized. And so they're not genetically identical, which is one of the reasons you know, that you can't have a, a son and a daughter at the same time. Okay, moving down into here, we get to see there, there are more types of deer down here. But you see, again, with the mule deer and with the elk, again, do the females have antlers? No. No, no, no antlers on the females. So that, that means that these guys are, you know, they, they don't have to work quite as hard to protect their offspring against predators as the caribou do. 
And keep in mind, like I said, that the caribou are the only species that uh, where, where the females have antlers. Now, in some of the things like the, the bighorn sheep and the mountain goats and all, the females do have horns, but they're smaller than the horns on the male. So what's the difference between a horn and an antler? Well, again, what's the difference between a horn? We are talking about what an antler is. What's an antler? It's bone, but what do you do? You shed it every year. With a horn, do you shed the horn? No. Okay, so that the horn then is actually part of your skull. The antler isn't. It grows out of your skull, but it's not really part of your skull. It's a separate thing. Whereas the horn, the horns actually have blood vessels and everything going up into the center of them. So when you look at things like the being the sheep and the mountain goats and the bison, these guys all have horns. The same thing with the pronghorn antelope over here. Yes? How many years of life does it take for a deer to start growing? Uh, they'll usually, the, the males will start growing them the second year of life, but they're, 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 li they're little. It takes them, you know, three or four years to actually grow big antlers. So that when you look at young males, they'll often have, a, have an intermediate form. So if you look at these pronghorn antelope here, you see that, now here's a real interesting case, because here you have an animal that has horns, but the females have horns. No, they don't. And why, why can the females get away with not having horns? Because they're really fast. They're really fast. These guys can run 50 or 60 miles an hour. They're, they, they are the fastest animal in North America and one of the fastest animals in the world. And so when, when you have an animal where the males have horns and the females don't, what does that suggest that the horns are actually used for? Well, so they use the horns to make no, them? Right. Just to display it to show no, All right, yeah. They're, they're used for, for the males to compete with one another to, to show sort of their status and their size and everything like that. So in theory, the females are more attractive to males with bigger horns. Yeah, that, that's also supposed to be true with the deer. Now when you look at the bison, <laughs> the females do have horns. They're smaller than the males, but the, the females have horns just the same as the, the males do. And they're almost the same size. They're a little thinner, but, but they're almost the same size. Mm -hmm. And now what I want to do is, is switch a little bit to when we're, we're talking here. We've talked about dogs and, and other animals. And here, what's, what's this guy right here? All right, that's a coyote. This guy right here in front of us. Oh. All right, this, guy, this is a coyote. And how do you tell a coyote from a wolf? It's smaller. Yeah, and they're smaller, thinner, they have bigger ears. And they used to live in different parts of the country, but now they, they kind of overlap so much because wolves got, were exterminated in a lot of areas, and coyotes sort of moved into the, the empty spots where the wolves used to live. Now we move over to here. And you get you get the actual wolves. Hmm? Now, how many of you guys have a wolf that lives in your house? No, all dogs are wolves. So all all of the dogs we have in the world are come from this. These are their ancestors. Okay, what type of dogs do you guys have or your friends have? Chihuahua. Alright, is it, is it easy to think of a chihuahua as a wolf? Why not? Oh, why, why do you think so? Alright, they do, well, the, 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 the weird thing is wolves really don't attack. They, they, they take prey, but they don't go after people. There, there are almost no accounts in North America, and up until recently, there, there, were, there were zero accounts of wolves and humans attacking humans in North America. Because they, they, 
basically had very good relationships with humans up until the last hundred years or so. So when you're looking at a different, what, what other types of dogs do you guys have? German Shepherd. All right, German Shepherd. A German Shepherd looks quite a bit like a wolf in a lot of ways, right? Because they, they actually are a, a quite a, a wolf-like dog. Now, if you look there, if you see this, this kit fox, or swift fox down here on the, the ground between the coyote and the, the little guy there, he's about the size of a lot of the little dogs that people keep. Well, he's actually bigger than a chihuahua. He's about the size of a cocker spaniel or a... Uh, hmm? I know this is crazy. Yeah, well, yeah, German Shepherds are and wolves are about the same size. There, there are a lot of wolf-like breeds. But when, when you're looking, thinking about all the different types of dogs, what, how do you tell a dog from a wolf? Is it a dog's bark? Well, well they bark throughout their whole entire lives, and mm -hmm. wolves only bark on their pups. All right. Any other, other thing do you use to tell them apart? Suppose you couldn't. Suppose you you, you, you couldn't hear them hear them. Or they weren't barking. How could you tell a wolf from a dog? Mm -hmm. They look different. All right, so they look different in what ways? They look tougher. All right, a lot of dogs are smaller. There are some dogs that are larger than any wolves, like things like St. Bernard's and Newfoundland's and, and Great Danes and Bull Mastiffs and all are, are bigger than wolves ever get, which is one reason those guys have. Now, now here, here's sort of a question for you guys in terms of epigenetics and everything. Uh, why do little dogs have longer lifespans than big dogs? Because they use less energy. Well, yeah, they could use less energy, but that doesn't necessarily, I mean, because you, you could feed your dog as much as possible, but there's, some, there's something that goes wrong in, in really big breeds of dog that doesn't happen to go wrong in small breeds of dog. All right, here, here's, here, this, this relates to the question I've been asking you guys. We're looking, we're looking at wolves and dogs. I'm asking you guys to, to, how do you tell them apart? Now, is every, do you, is every criteria you use for telling them apart based upon how they look on the outside? Yeah. So what, yeah, well, all behavior, well, behavior is part of the outside, yes, but, but their appearance, right? Now, if you looked inside them, one of the things that's kind of odd is that small dogs have big hearts and lungs relative to their body size. Big dogs cannot get a heart or lungs bigger than a wolf can. So that they have, they have a heart that's not really big enough to run the engine that they're running. And so they, they, they tend to have short lifespans because it wears down on them because they're having to run a much bigger body. It's like trying to run a Cadillac with a Volkswagen engine. <laughs> you know, it just, it might look impressive on the outside, but, but it was not going to last very long, right? Well, it's the same thing here, is that the hearts and lungs and all the other organs, people who selected for, for breed, to create breeds of dog didn't think about them what the animal looks like on the inside, they only selected for the outside. And they let whatever happened on the inside happen. And so they ended up with, with when you get a really big dog, the one that weighs 150, 200 pounds, their heart and lungs and other parts of their body are, are actually still the same size as the heart and lungs of a 100 pound wolf like this. Can you tell like um, the wolf's relationships like a dog by like the skull shape to which one are more related to wolves? Well, sort of. Some, some, people, some people are trying to do that. Again, it's going to depend on the breed. And, and one of the things that, that people are doing, like you, you're talking about your German Shepherd, your German Shepherd has a skull that looks quite a bit like a wolf's skull. There are a few differences. One of the ways that, that I, I can use it, especially, but, but again, you know, you're talking about the skull. How do you tell it in the living animal? There is, there is a general rule which is that dogs tend to have more of a forehead than wolves do. Wolves, don't have, wolves slope straight from the, the uh, top of the skull straight down along the snout. Dogs have a little bit of a forehead, and that's a, that's a puppy character that gets kept into adulthood. Because one of the things we need to realize about a lot of our dogs, even some of the biggest ones, 
is that they're carrying puppy traits into adulthood. Like, how many of you guys have dogs that have floppy ears? All right. Wolves don't have floppy ears. Dogs do. But wolf puppies have floppy ears. How many of you guys have a dog that has short legs? All right, again, wolf wolves, adult wolves don't have short legs, but their puppies have short legs. So that what you're doing, what we what we do when we're when we're creating breeds of dog is we're taking animals and trying to get them to stay puppies as long as possible. <laughs> their entire life if we can. But the, the thing is, is that the, the animals end up kind of weird because imagine that you still had the mind of a four-year-old but you were sexually mature. <laughs> well, what do you think your behavior would be like? A little odd, right, in some ways? Well, that, with a lot of the dogs, that's what we've got. So we've got animals that, that are still babies in their appearance, but they become, they're, they're sexually mature at six months old. So you can imagine why they get a little confused. <laughs> and why they act, some of them act out at all. And if you, you ever watch Caesar Milan or his TV show or any of the stuff like that, where he's talking about you know, the, 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 you know, the, the animal, you need, to, you need to create a relaxed atmosphere for an animal. If, you, if your animal's relaxed and calm, and knows that you're in charge, but that you'll take care of it, you'll have a happy animal. When you have a, a small animal, when you have an animal that's, that's insecure and nervous, that's when you're more likely to get nip, nipped by it, or something like that, or have an attack like you were talking about. Because a lot of these, anim these animals are sort of insecure because physically, they're still, they're, 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 they're babies on the outside, but adults on the inside. I'm trying to imagine what that would be like. But that's what we have in a lot of the breeds of dog that we have that we work with. Okay, now we move over. This is, this is kind of the area that we have, the, the, the kind of habitat we have around here. Where you have woodchucks and wild turkeys and black bears and red foxes. Now what's the difference between the red fox and the kit fox? Their coloration is right. Their, their colors are different. This is why these guys are these guys are called red, but are they actually red? No. Okay. Here's the thing about when you look at mammal colors, are there any mammals that have really bright colors on their bodies? No. All right. Why is that? Yeah, there's there's nobody in this group who has purple hair. In the last the other class, there was a girl with purple hair. <laughs> But none of you guys have purple hair. But okay, what, what is the range of, of possible hair colors in, in humans or in any mammal? Black. Yeah, black, brown, and maybe if you have very little red. pigment in it, it can be white. Yeah, you know, red. Red is a pigment, but it's a, but it's a it's one pigment present, but another not. So when you look at you know the, you look at all of these animals we've looked at, what colors? What's the range of colors they all have? All the mammals. Brown, brown, brown. So when we call something a red fox, what are we really calling it? Brown. brown. Yeah, kind of a red, a red, a sort of an orangey brown mm -hmm. color. Whereas when you have birds, how brightly colored can birds get? And why? And why is that? Yeah, the, the, because feathers are really, birds and lizards and fish and amphibians can be all sorts of colors because they don't have fur. Fur is very limited in the range of colors that you, you could produce. Everything's a variation from um, basically brown, and if it's really intense, it looks almost black. And if it's really pale, it looks like what we call blonde. Although in this group there are really no blondes, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, do you, do you want to talk a little about the, about the tropics since yes. you, were, you, were, you were bringing that up the last time, or you want me to do it? Yeah, you can do it. Okay. When we get to the tropics. 
especially in the Americas, we get a real interesting mix of things. We get, you know, I see up there the macaw. That's, a, that's a, like a parrot. See that he's, he's pretty colorful, right? All right, now you look at the monkeys. There's two different types of monkey there. There's a howler monkey and a spider monkey. The spider monkey is this one over here, and that's the howler monkey up in the tree. And when you get down into the, tri into, into the rainforest like this, this is what a deer looks like. Now, is this deer a male or a female? And how can you tell? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or he's a male because he has a little horn. But look at how little he is. He's baby. No, it's not a baby. It's full so, grown. Is it like because there's more vegetation around the rainforest, so it needs need to be smaller? Well, there's there's all sorts of reasons, but but if you're going to live in a rainforest, there are very few big animals that live in rainforests. That's that's something that, that people tell, tell you about when they're talking about rain saving rainforests. That one of the biggest animals that lives in the rainforest is that animal back there standing with, with, with sort of poking its head out of the... Anybody know what that is? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a tapeworm. And, and he's not that big, especially when you realize that his rel he's related to rhinoceroses. Those are, that's his closest relative is the rhinoceros. Now this, this pig here, this is a pig called a peccary. This is called a white-lipped pecker, and over there you have the collared peckers in the desert. And then you have a little squirrel up there, and you have all sorts of fancy, you know, they, see the toucan here? Now with some birds, their feathers aren't colorful, but where do they put the color? Their beaks. The beak or their feet. You see, you'll see some birds that have really brightly colored feet or beaks. And those are birds where their body, the, 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 the color of the feathers on their body is really important to help camouflage them to a degree. So what type of bird is this? Do you guys recognize it? Yeah, yeah it's a toucan. That's what a real toucan looks like. Not, not like the ones in the, in the uh, cereal commercial. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, did anybody have any questions about, oh, one other more thing. We were, we were talking earlier about the difference between horns and antlers. Here, here you can see they have, an exhibit, they have an exhibit that shows those are horns on that side and antlers on this side. And you can see the deer and the buffalo here. Yeah, it's a real antler. And what you can see is that you see where the, the, the deer antlers attach to the skull, but they, they when they shed them, they, it just breaks free. And you can see, if you look at the bottom of this, you can see how it breaks off. It, yeah. it, here, here's like the, where the bottom of it would be. And so it just breaks off without doing any damage to the skull. But if you look at the, the bison, you can see the, the, on one of them they have the horn core, which is part of the skull, and then the horn which is over it. So you can see that the, the, the horns, horns are actually part of the skull of the man. Antlers are, are not. Antlers are growth off the skull. In fact, it's really weird that antlers, in some ways, one of the people was studied, when when the people are studying cancer, they look at antlers. Why why would people studying cancer look at antlers? They're so close. Yeah, because they're having an incredible period of group, of cell growth that's really fast. Like in a couple of months, they grow. They go from nothing to this. So people are trying to figure out how, how cell growth gets regulated. Now how, how, does a, how does a body part know when to stop uh, when or to the, start growing? Genetic information through the nucleus of the DNA. Well, okay, now you, you guys are telling me some basic stuff, but what actually what's going on in the nucleus or with the DNA to tell a, uh, something to start or stop? The DNA expresses the gene that tells us to stop. Does it? All right. What? What? Let's say when you're looking at a mammal growing, what what happens when it's it's, it's an embryo? What 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 happens when it starts to grow a new part? Let's say a leg or an arm. The head's there all along, but in growing an egg, a leg or an arm is a different thing. So what happens? It 
How, did, how, did, how does it know how to build an R? How does your body know how to build an R? It grows, your body starts growing the bone. Body, your, body, your, your cells don't, don't do anything to muscles or nerves or blood vessels except tell them follow the bone. So if you get, start growing it, you have, how many bones do you have up in here? One. You have two? No. One. One. Two up here. One. All right, you have one, one here, you and two, two, you. two here, a whole bunch. <laughs> this can vary. When I worked in the Dominican Republic, I, I had a field assistant who had six fingers. He had an extra finger grew up right here. So when somebody's Somebody. amputated, does their arm still grow? No. There, and that's, that's, that's a really good question. Though. Why, why can't humans or other mammals grow a new limb if they lose Scar one? Isn't it because the scar's over? Well, scarring over is sort of the phenomenon that happens afterwards. But why, why don't they, you know, like if, if you look at a, a, a sea star, yeah, or something like that, and you cut them up in pieces and they grow a new one. You cut an earthworm in half and they'll grow a new one. You guys are on, you guys are sort of giving me some really good ideas.